this version of the uh, course, Groundbreaking Discoveries in Cals. Uh, Sally Leong will talk about her work, with, about her work that went before on the uptake of, bank, bank of iron ion uh, by several organisms. Sally. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Put that in your pocket. Oh. You have a left-handed shirt and you have oh. a right-handed clamp. Oh, okay. <laughs> Is that working for people? Okay. Well, thanks for coming to my seminar. Today I'm going to tell you about uh, a, non, a story about a non-protein pigment containing iron. And the color of that pigment has an um, absorbance maximum of 425, so it's kind of the color of the slide. <laughs> First, I'd like to tell you about Joe Neelans. Uh, he, uh, this is a picture of him at uh, University of California, Berkeley, the biochemistry department where he was a faculty member. But he started his career here um, at, at UW-Madison in the 1940s, late 40s, as a student of Frank Strong in the Department of Biochemistry. And his thesis was on uh, the topic uh, indicated there, uh, vitamin and amino acid content of fish and meat products molybdenum toxicity in the rat, and bound pantothenic acid. Uh, as you may have been hearing in some of the other talks, uh, it, that period of, of science was a heyday here for the discovery of vitamins and um, the role of, and their role in, in um, human and animal nutrition and, and actually microbial nutrition, um, and also um, the, the elements like molybdenum and, and iron. So as I mentioned, uh, Joe became a professor at University of California, Berkeley, uh, starting in 1951 through 1994. Um, he initially, initially was known for his work on proteins, uh, cytochrome C in particular, and uh, lactate dehydrogenase. And he produced let's see, um, uh, a seminal volume, uh, which was used all over the world uh, for um, teaching uh, students about enzyme um, isolation and chemistry. Paul J. Allen was a professor in the Department of, of Botany and, and also had a, 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 a adjunct appointment in my department, the Department of Plant Pathology. And in the early, uh, either late 40s or early 50s, he started studying uh, a fungus, a smut fungus called Eustilagos ferrogena that causes um, a smut on a barnyard grass. And uh, he was looking at the nutrition and physiology of this fungus. And he found that when he produced the cells in a synthetic uh, vitamin and amino acid growth medium, that the cells took on a very reddish coloration. Uh, in other media, they tended to be more white, white colored. And, uh, he went through a process of deleting and adding different substances to the medium and found that um, this uh, zinc seemed to be involved in inducing this pigment, pig, pigmentation in the cells and it seemed to be related to cytochrome synthesis. He asked Joe to collaborate with him on this <laughs> and uh, Joe did determine that there was elevated cytochrome C but um, he was also finding a non-protein red-orange pigment that could not be precipitated as proteins can be with saturated ammonium acetate sulfate. Uh, he was able to extract this pigment with a uh, chemical called benzyl alcohol and eventually crystallize it with methanol. And this led to a paper uh, which he published from University of Wisconsin-Madison, and, and this is not a rust fungus, it's a smut fungus. Um, uh, entitled Crystalline Organo Iron Pigment from a Rust Fungus. And uh, he named the pigment ferrochrome, fer meaning iron and chrome meaning colored. This is the structure of ferrochrome, which was determined a few years later uh, in this laboratory when, um, in, at Berkeley. And it's a cyclic hexapeptide consisting of three molecules of glycine, three molecules of ornithine, and the Nitrogen of ornithine is hydroxylated and acetylated to form this uh, iron chelating um, center, hydroxinate. 
so the proton is le lost on the uh, hydroxyl group, and this forms a very strong bond for ferric ion. Now we're living in an aerobic in atmosphere, and so iron two uh, doesn't exist very long. It's readily oxidized to iron three, and iron three has a very low solubility um, at pH seven. I think it's 10 to the minus 38th molar. So this has led to a whole field of biology in which microorganisms uh, uh, secrete compounds like ferrochrome in order to sequester iron and bring it back to the cell for its nutritional needs. So this whole system now, which was founded here at the University of Wisconsin uh, in the late 40s and early 50s, uh, is now referred to as uh, a high affinity iron transport system. It uh, consists of siderophores. In some of the literature you'll see the term siderochrome, but the more popular word is siderophore, sid meaning iron and four meaning transport. They are microbial, low molecular weight, um, ferric iron specific, although some other um, uh, metals can be bound to these chelators at lower affinity than iron. Their high affinity uh, association constants tend to be in the order of 10 to the 20th to 10 to the 30th per mole. And they're secreted, or some of them are cell associated. There's also a cognate membrane associated uptake system, which consists of um, usually membrane bound transporters, uh, sometimes a combination of proteins in the membranes. And these recognize the siderophore iron complex. Uh, some of them, um, in some cases, the iron is released at the membrane and the siderophore uh, and taken into the cell, and the siderophore is recycled into the environment. In other cases, there's evidence for co transport of the complex. In addition, these membrane receptors often, especially in bacteria, where this has been most studied, have additional affinities for sometimes toxic molecules. This collisins are proteins produced by one bacterium that, is, that are cytotoxic to another bacterium. So uh, collisins and bacteriophage, which you're familiar with. Um, so what, what can happen is uh, you can actually protect a cell from infection uh, by a bacteriophage or from killing by a collison by having the siderophore uh, available in the environment. And there's also cross-taxa cross ta siderophore utilization. For example, E. coli and Salmonella typhimurium uh, have a ferrochrome uptake system. So <laughs> this is a seminal uh, treatise that um, uh, Joe uh, wrote uh, on microbial iron metabolism. And here, he, he gave me a copy of the book. <laughs> And you can see his um, uh, strong uh, uh, interest in being a person of integrity, of using your taxpayer dollars for science uh, for a good reason. <laughs> so back to ferrochrome, just to remind you, it's a cyclic, pepsi cyclic hexapeptide, glycine and ornithine with hydroxamates. And um, I wanted to diverge a little bit to tell you about a story uh, uh, from Norman Horowitz, who was a faculty member at Caltech. And um, he was working with NASA on a project to simulate uh, low water activity environment in Mars, on Mars. And he was using the bread mold, Neurospora crassa, um, to study this. And he exposed the conidia, conidia spores of Neurospora crassa to what was considered a low water activity environment and he noticed that they were no longer able to germinate and grow. And tracked down what, what the material was that was lost from the spores, and it was a siderophore, a hydroxamate siderophore, known as ferrocrosin. So this study shows that uh, not only are there secreted siderophores, but there are siderophores inside cells that are important to uh, in, in, um, biology of the organism, it's in this case, uh, germination. Another study I want to bring to um, your attention is that siderophores can cause what are known as green islands on bean leaves. 
And this is a study also from the Neelands lab, Atkins and Neelands. And what was done here was to take excised um, bean leaves and spot, um, in this case, uh, the ligand, uh, Sidera for rhodotrolic acid, and the iron complex at millimolar, millimolar, and then uh, decreasing concentrations. And he, he, they were using a, a tween carrier, that's the control. And that's the top side of the leaf. The leaf has a waxy uh, um, uh, coating, so cuticle, so uh, that, that was probably the reason that tween was used. And uh, this is the underside of the leaf, again, with the rhodotrolic acid at um, uh, millimolar concentration. And these are some uh, this control uh, tween. And then these are some other sidereophores that were looked at, uh, deferi sidereophores. But what, what was striking was that there was a kind of a dark darkening of the zone where the sidereophore was, and then a, a yellowing around that. Um, over time, the, the leaves turned yellow, but these zones ma maintained a, a green color. So this was interesting because I was aware of this paper. I was working as an undergraduate in Joe's lab uh, in the 1970s, and um, uh, started to have a chance to do undergraduate research, something that I really encourage all of you, uh, get a job in a lab, and hopefully you'll get your own research project. It's a very exciting opportunity, and uh, so uh, at the same time, I started to get interested in, in plants and um, uh, siderophores uh, and how siderophores might affect uh, disease development. Uh, caused by pathogens of plants. And I was in one of the libraries at UC Berkeley, and uh, often I would just take off books off the shelf if I was looking up something, and then I would just spend some time looking at <laughs> surrounding books. And I happened to pick up, guess who, <laughs> Paul J. Allen's thesis. Uh, he was a student, the, the professor of botany, uh, who um, uh, collaborated with Joe uh, on Ustilago and um, the zinc effect on cytochrome synthesis. Uh, he was a graduate student <laughs> at Berkeley. Joe was a graduate student in, in here, and Paul was a graduate student there. And so his thesis title was Physiological Responses of Wheat Leaves Induced by Infection with Aerocyphe Graminus. And uh, one of the uh, topics that was uh, examined in that thesis was the Green Island effect. So I was just wondering at that point as an undergraduate, you know, how can all this be related to plant, plant disease? And so fast forward, I got a job here uh, in, as a faculty member in the Department of Plant Pathology. And uh, I decided that I wanted to look at this uh, phenomenon uh, in a plant disease. And so I uh, chose to work with the corn smut disease caused by Eustilago matus. This is a different um, uh, species of Eustilago, um, but uh, has many advantages. It causes this corn smut disease, which you may have seen out driving around. Uh, today, most varieties of corn are, are resistant due to breeding, but uh, this in Mexico is highly uh, sought after. It's, it's consumed called huila hoche, and um, uh, it is also often served in kind of gourmet restaurants. Uh, if you slice this open, you would see a black powder, and this is a, a close-up view of, of those bl the black powder, which are teleospores, that are the um, diploid spores that are produced in the, at the infection site. So just to review how pathogens cause disease, they first have to contact their host. Uh, usually there's an attachment process, a penetration, uh, either between cells or into cells, host cells, a colonization, reproduction, and then dispersal to a new host. So what we were seeing there was the reproduction uh, into form these telospores. This is an overview of the life cycle of uh, Eustilago and what uh, Neelins and Allen and, uh, were working with were these, uh, excuse me, hang on. Uh, th 
these, these spores here, uh, they uh, are the sporidia that um, are haploid, and uh, there are two mating types. So you have to cross two uh, different strains of opposite mating type and infect any aerial tissue of the corn plant, leaves, or what we saw uh, in the last slide was, or a few slides ago, was a uh, ear infection. The actual kernels were infected. And so these two spores of opposite mating type will cross with one, with one another and form a dicaryotic mycelium, and that, that's the infectious phase of the fungus. And so if you just inoculated one type of spore, one mating type, you wouldn't get an infection. And then you get the colonization and production of the gall, as we saw, and there's a um, formation of those diploid spores called teliospores, and you can have leaf galls or ear galls, as I mentioned. And then those black spores can undergo meiosis to give you back the products of meiosis. So this organism it, it was a really great one to choose because before I even began to work with it, uh, the classical genetics had been well established by Robin Holiday, who um, uh, developed the Robin the Holiday model of recombination, actually working with Eustilago matus. So uh, complementation analysis was possible, meiotic recombination analysis, and Mendelian genetic analysis, and a rudimentary genetic map was available. So in my laboratory and other laboratories, but I think we deserve a lot of credit for getting some of the main techniques established, uh, we were able to develop a DNA-mediated transformation system, ways to uh, take a clone gene, uh, manipulate it in the lab, and and like make a mutation in it, disruption mutation, and, and transform that back and get um, homologous recombination to substitute the wild gene with this mutated gene. Um, gene replacement, um, very similar uh, technique, but you can actually refine that to put like reporter genes and other kinds of modifications. And uh, we were able to separate the chromosomes with electrophoretic karyotyping and do physical mapping on chromosomes. And then the whole field of genomics exploded in the late 90s and the last decade. So one of the things that we first did was to develop the transformation protocol. At the time, really, um, there were just inklings of transformation with Neurospora and Aspergillus. And yeast had been well established as an uh, organism of rec for recombinant DNA biology. So we were able to ma make um, transformation vectors. These are plasmids. These are uh, bacterial self-replicating DNAs. Uh, you select for the um, transformants in E. coli using a drug resistance marker, in this case for ampicillin or penicillin resistance. And we had to engineer our own drug resistance marker that would work um, would be transcribed and translated and expressed, uh, fully expressed in, in Eustilago. And we were able to do this. Robin Holiday happened, I invited him to give a seminar <laughs> here, and he visited, and then we went to uh, E. coli Club, which was a um, cross-campus um, seminar, uh, monthly seminar, and uh, he spoke about the heat shock response in Eustilago. And on our campus, we have we had, at the time, Carol Gross working in E. coli, and in particular, Betty Craig, uh, chair of biomolecular chemistry, who was really the person of, of, um, to recognize in this field. She was working on the heat shock genes of Drosophila and yeast. And from going to those seminars, uh, I learned that there's you know, quite a lot of gene conservation among heat shock genes. And so as Robin Holiday was leaving, bells were ringing <laughs> that I should really get a hold of some of those genes and see if I could find homologs of those genes uh, in Eustilago so that we could engineer a promoter a chimeric, chimeric um, drug resistance marker that would function in Eustilago. We had tried yeast genes and aspergillus genes and <laughs> a variety of genes, and we weren't getting anywhere. It was very frustrating. And indeed, using 
pro DNA probes for some conserved genes, the HSP70 gene of uh, Drosophila in yeast. Uh, homologs of Eustilago genes were identified, and an HSP70 promoter was used to drive this hydromycin gene, leading to success. And this is just a show how transformation can work. Um, we would take, make protoplasts, wallless cells, each membrane containing on average a, a, a nucleus, and then expose them to DNA. And uh, we found that linearization of the DNA greatly enhanced the um, transformation frequency. This is the particular vector used here, PHL1 uncut, and if we cut the vector, we got about a tenfold enhancement, and then this is the control with just carrier DNA. So we were in business. We could start uh, doing complementation, molecular complementation with gene libraries. But first we had to make some mutants. <laughs> and so uh, the biosynthesis of this um, uh, molecule, let me backtrack. Uh, uh, I mentioned earlier that cross-species utilization of ferrochrome was possible by Salmonella and E. coli. So I had learned as an undergraduate at uh, University of California, Berkeley, Department of Biochemistry, that uh, Bruce Ames' lab had isolated enterochelin uh, mutants. Uh, enterochelin is the siderophore of uh, Salmonella and E. coli. And the, this particular mutant, ENB7, could no longer synthesize enterochelin. And would not grow very well on iron deficient media. This mutant also can use ferrochrome as a source of iron. So by using or knowing this, we could design a um, bio uh, indicator uh, system to identify mutants unable to produce siderophores, um, used to lago mutants. So we could spot we can take a paper disc of salmonella, or excuse me, of ferrochrome, and put it on a petri dish with in an iron deficient medium, and this will feed and make a halo of growth around the salmonella, uh, around, uh, around the disc, feeding the um, colonies uh, or the, the lawn of bacteria. We found that we could put uh, ustilago onto this medium, and it would also form. Uh, the colonies of Eustilago would form halos on the indicator lawn. So this allowed us to isolate um, siderophore non-producing mutants. We were also interested in uh, production or, or regulation of siderophore production. And in all systems, this is iron regulated. You don't want to produce too much. Too much. Uh, you want to. You don't want. You want to regulate the amount of iron in the cell. Iron uh, can create free radicals. And so you don't want to have a lot of iron in the cell, uh, more than, you, than the cell needs. And so every, every cell, our cells, bacteria cells, regulate the uptake. Uh, the intracellular sets to their force may, um, may be one way for cells to protect the, the in interior environment of the cell through um, chelation of the, the, the iron, just as in our cells we have a protein called transferrin, which is a storage pro or excuse me, ferritin, which is a storage protein for iron. So uh, to look for constitutive mutants, we grew the salmonella mutant on a rich iron medium, and it grew as a thick lawn. But if we put um, a paper disc of, of uh, excuse me, if we put a um, strain of, of ustilago on the, the medium, which uh, was constitutively producing siderophores, um, it would produce um, a, um, a zone of, of no growth. Because the siderophores see what um, are, are, are um, chelating the iron in that zone. So we were able to get three classes of mutants ferrochrome, ferrochrome, uh, and ferrochrome A minus and cons constitutive. This is the proposed biosynthetic pathway for these two compounds. Um, uh, the first step is uh, a hydroxylation of the ornithine nitrogen. And then the 
the pathways for ferrochrome in ferrochrome A would uh, um, uh, go two directions. I didn't really tell you about ferrochrome A. That's a second siderophore. Um, uh, ferrochrome has three glycines and three ornithines. And the, as I mentioned, there's a um, hydroxylation and acetylation, and it's a cyclic peptide. Uh, ferrochrome A has a trans beta methyl glutaconyl group and um, has two glycines and uh, one serine. So, again, we made libraries and were able to transform um, and complement uh, the various mutations, and we were able to isolate a gene for ornithine um, oxygenase and a gene involved in peptide synthetase, synthesis, uh, non-ribosomal peptide synthesis. As it turns out, these low molecular weight compounds like ferrochrome and ferrochrome A, uh, antibiotics and other small molecules tend to be produced on not, uh, not by ribosomes but by non-ribosomal peptide synthetases. So our first gene that we isolated was very exciting. We found um, uh, we call it SID1. It's the ornithine um, N5-oxygenase. And it showed, uh, when we sequenced the gene, uh, uh, some identity to E. coli ICUD, which is a um, lysine in 6-hydroxylase. Um, uh, uh, it plays a similar function in the biosynthesis of uh, aerobactin, the CDR4 aerobactin. And so this is just the uh, simple structure of the gene. Um, it was, we showed that it was iron regulated and that we could um, establish that the gene uh, was producing a, a enzyme activity consistent with this oxygenase. Um, so here is the specific, specific activity of, in the wild type strain of the enzyme in low iron that shows iron regulation. Uh, this is one of our uh, nitrosoguanidine induced mutants. This is a disruption strain. It's cleaner than, a than the nitrosoguanidine mutant. And this is the complemented strain with the um, clone gene. So back to the pathway. Um, we then pursued uh, trying to clone the uh, gene uh, involved in peptide synthesis. Um, and indeed, we did uh, clone gene SID2. Uh, which DNA sequence analysis showed encoded a non-ribosomal peptide synthetase. As we expected, there are three modules, and they showed strong identities with um, all the various uh, domains, subdomains, uh, adenylation domain, acyl carrier domain, um, and condens condensation domain. Uh, so what happens in these domains is that uh, each of these modules is a single amino acid is um, uh, covalently bound through a thioester bond, and um, then the peptide bonds are formed between um, a growing chain uh, between the different modules. We did not have a chance to pursue uh, more structure function work with this, and. Uh, we predicted that these modules might be re reused um, more than once. Uh, in a second gene, and a second peptide synthetase was not discovered uh, for ferrochrome synthesis um, in uh, later studies. And so uh, that's still the working hypothesis today. We also, as I mentioned, were studying um, uh, iron regulation. And we were able to isolate a Uselager regulator of biosynthesis of siderophores, herbs one and uh, the gene encodes about a thousand amino acid protein with two structural features which I'll refer to as zinc fingers. Um, this is the um, general structure of a zinc finger. Um, it has a zinc um, bound by four cysteines and other very conserved uh, st structures um, in this loop domain. Uh, Another interesting sequence that we discovered was 21 histidines in a 28 amino acid stretch. So uh, you know, these could be involved in um, metal sensing. So here's just a sequence comparison of 
different finger domains. Um, uh, the, some of the earliest ones found were involved in hem hem uh, hemoglobin biosynthesis regulation from chicken and, and human uh, and mouse, and also some fungal uh, nitrogen regulatory genes. Generally, these are referred to as GATA factors because the target sequence contains the sequence GATA. So this is the, um, those cysteines involved in um, coordination of the zinc. So our working model, based on what was known already in bacteria such as E. coli, was that the herbs gene uh, would um, somehow bind to target DNAs and turn them off at the promoter regions via repressor in the presence of iron. In the absence of iron, it would not be bound to DNA. So uh, what we found was quite interesting is that the SID1 and SID2 genes are actually divergently expressed, uh, positioned on the chromosome. But there was a very large 3.7 kilobase, 3,700 base pairs in between the two genes. And this intervening region is shown here. You can see all these different GATA sequences all potentially <laughs> involved in regulation. So through deletion analysis, uh, where we, we fused a reporter gene uh, to the SID1 gene here um, uh, for beta-glucuronidase, gives you a color metric assay that you can measure. Um, we uh, examined some different deletions of the upstream region, and we found these two quite a ways upstream, uh, or one of these was significantly important to regulation. And here we show those two. And when we delete, um, make these different deletions, and we um, measure the beta-glucuronidase activity, you can see in low and high iron that the wild type, we see nice regulation. Uh, after we remove this um, GATA sequence, we see some diminished regulation, but the second one leads to complete um, deregulation. So uh, we wanted to ask uh, whether or not these sequences were important to, um, what sequences were important to binding to these target sequences. And so we designed a, what's called an in vitro gel shift assay. So you can take the target DNA sequence and then an extract or a purified protein of your DNA, putative DNA binding factor, and ask can they bind together. Um, and so here is the DNA only. It migrates on a gel this, at this rate. Um, here's with um, uh, the mutant. Uh, extract, and here's a complemented extract, and you see that some of the uh, DNA has been shifted uh, by after binding to the DNA. And uh, so uh, here we have uh, made the mutant um, in, in the left finger, or the N-terminal finger, and here we have the mutant in the right terminal finger, this arginine to leucine. And that's uh, in the GATA, chicken GATA, that controls erythroid, um, uh, con controls transcription of the globin genes. Uh, this area is very important to uh, binding to the DNA target. And, and indeed, um, a mutation in the, the C-terminal finger did uh, uh, considerably wipe, uh, lower the efficiency of DNA binding. And, you might say, well, what if your protein wasn't <laughs> being made? And Western blood analysis, uh, it's a technique where you can move the, the um, you can um, run your proteins on a, um, a gel uh, to separate them by size and then adhere the proteins to uh, a membrane and then probe the membranes with um, uh, uh, antibody. And we found that there was plenty of it protein in all these extracts that was um, homologous to the herbs protein. Okay, um, so that showed that that uh, the second finger, this uh, C-terminal finger, was important to DNA binding. Um, and our our deletion studies had suggested that the um, uh, proximal GATA was more important to uh, regulation. 
And so this is an in vitro test of that. So we have the wild type, those two GATA sequences, and then we've made specific mutations in uh, this, this, or the double mutation. And so using the gel shift assay again, um, uh, we can see that um, these different one, two, three, four, uh, the wild type, um, the N terminal, the C terminal, and the double mutant. So again, uh, the in vitro assay confirms the um, work with the uh, in vivo um, uh, fusion studies with the reporter gene. So uh, we were very interested to understand you know, how this might uh, all be working, especially with such very long, far away um, data sequences, almost a couple of kilobases away from the um, start of transcription. And so we came up with some simple models. Uh, we were not able to pursue this work uh, due to lack of funding. <laughs> Um, unfortunately, uh, this kind of model actually is, is uh, being pursued and, and uh, demonstrated in, in some of the other, uh, like the uh, uh, heme, uh, or the, excuse me, the globin uh, gene regulation, uh, where you have very long distance regulation. Uh, we began to uh, start to pursue this to isolate chromatin and do in vitro DNA binding assays and um, trying to look at this in more detail. But uh, because this is a seminar about doing, uh, being a scientist, I would just like to say this was back in the like, late, mid to late 90s when we got to this point. And uh, what happened was NIH, the National Institutes of Health, uh, started to have a funding crunch. <laughs> and so it became very difficult to get your grant funded again. And so it was very frustrating. Uh, and they instituted what's called a, a, Oh, see, a, a triage system. So I actually served on an NIH uh, study section, which is a review panel for several years uh, in the early 90s. So, but then in the late 90s, they decided to, to streamline their review process that they would just tell people, your grant was triaged. They won't give you a score or any review <laughs> to tell you what, what was wrong and what, what you should do better to uh, compete better in a, another round of grants. And so I got caught into that, and actually we actually pr produced all this, almost all this work with the in vitro studies I mentioned, <laughs> and published in very good journals like the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences and EMBO Journal and so forth. And those were, were, were studies that we said we were going to do, <laughs> but unfortunately, because of the very difficult uh, fiscal times, uh, we could not get funded. So I, 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 ha I, I must say that around this time, we pretty much uh, gave up our work on, on this very, very uh, heartfelt project that I had been working on since the 1970s um, as starting as an undergraduate. Um, but um, all is not lost. <laughs> Part of the problem was we were working with a plant pathogen, which was a very good model system. As I told you, Robin Holiday had he had you know, uh, come up with his holiday model of recombination working in this plant pathogen. But in the meantime, uh, many, many human pathogens, uh, fungal human pathogens, were beginning to catch up with you know, developing transformation systems and other technologies. And there was a clear role for iron um, in, in virulence in, in a lot of these systems. So, in our system, you know, we could not <laughs> really make the same kind of justification for continued funding. And in addition, as you'll be hearing uh, next week uh, or next next Thursday, uh, many of these systems were finding the same genes that we had discovered in, in Aspergillus fumigatus and, and Candida and other other um, um, human pathogens of very very uh, grave significance. So that was that. <laughs> um, it's just a story to tell you, but I would like to um, go back uh, and, and also address the issue of corn smut disease. And um, I mentioned the idea that had originally got me involved with this organism, which, which was you know, the insight about green islands and sudorifores. Well, unfortunately, we also were not able to show that these mutants that we had isolated had any significant um, 
uh, impact on their um, uh, ability to infect the corn seedlings. Now these assays are pretty artificial, they're in growth chambers and so perhaps maybe in, in the environment out in the field it might have been a different story. Um, of course uh, we only had a handful of mutants and we knew that we were missing gene, you know, some of the genes uh, and were there other uh, compounds, uh, sidereophores, that we didn't know about? And could the plant actually, uh, the cit plant, plant uses iron uh, citrate as a way to move iron around. And uh, the laboratory of Tom Emery had shown that iron citrate can be a source of iron for Ustilago. So there were a lot of questions about whether, you know, uh, our particular uh, results were, were definitive or not at the time. But I also had funding from the USDA and it makes it hard to <laughs> continue to work on, on a, a project when, when you don't have a strong uh, role uh, for uh, uh, effect on disease. So fast forward then, uh, in the last decade, the genome sequence of Ustilago was determined by an international group of researchers, and um, this revealed that there were more sidereophore genes as we expected. Of course, we had not looked at the ferrochrome A uh, genes, and there was, there's probably still um, an acetylase that we're missing for ferrochrome synthesis. There could be other peptide synthetases too. So these are the two genes I've been describing. They're expressed uh, divergently and on chromosome one. And the genome sequence uh, revealed uh, several other, 10 other potential um, iron um, gathering genes. And uh, this is the work of, of uh, Regina Kamen's lab at Marburg, Mar Marburg in Germany. So, uh, some of the genes in this cluster are, are now known to be involved in ferrochrome A synthesis. This is the peptide synthetase uh, needed for that uh, cyclic peptide synthesis. And uh, fer1 and fer2 uh, are involved in iron uptake. So they encode respectively a ferrooxidase and a ferric ion permease. And these kind of genes have been found initially in yeast, but are now becoming more um, widely discovered. So it seems that many organisms are wanting to keep a balance between ferric and ferrous and fer ferric ion um, outside the cell. So they will actually oxidize the uh, ferrous ion to ferric ion and then take up the um, ion itself into the cell. So this is work again from the common lab and just to show you what, what's happening with uh, inoculation of plants, uh, as I told you, you have to take two spores, haploid spores of, of opposite mating type. So that's what this is, wild type times wild type. And here, these dark colors refer to tumors or dead plants. So you can see that uh, out of 107 plants, most of them were, you know, had many tumors and some even died. So here's the oxidase, uh, ferrooxidase mutant times the ferrooxidase mutant. And you can see um, very few tumors were formed. Um, only you know, about 30% of the plants or 40% of the plants were able to produce tumors. Um, and what's interesting is this um, indicates chlorosis. So you, uh, they didn't really investigate this, but you wonder, could this be related to somehow um, uh, hypersecretion of sidereophores maybe um, into the t leaf tissue. Um, and here's the ferric permease also showing even more stringent um, uh, disruption in its ability to cause disease. And these are just control, controls where you cross a wild type with um, a strain of uh, mutant strain. And they kind of show intermediate, surprisingly. So, so original uh, investigation was, or s stimulus to study the system in part was to investigate how, how uh, 
what role uh, iron gathering systems might have in pathogenesis. And clearly, um, the, the spherophores themselves, um, maybe because of redundancy uh, of other systems, are, are not sufficient for pathogenesis. But um, uh, there are systems that are, are critical, the, the transport of ferric iron um, is, is critical, um, in this case, to pathogenesis. So iron is important. <laughs> Finally, I'd like to touch on um, the, another area of, of, of study with iron chelators, these iron chelators. And NIH has uh, long supported the, the investigation of iron chelators for clinical use. Uh, and every few years they have a um, symposium uh, on this topic. I went to three of them myself and talked to all of them. And uh, they strongly support the, the work. Uh, I talked about the work that I just talked about. Um, and uh, so uh, this is very important because um, many people suffer from uh, diseases of the blood, like sickle cell anemia. They produce a defective hemoglobin, or they pro don't produce enough hemoglobin. So they require whole body transfusions on a regular basis. Your body is a closed circuit with regard to iron. So iron accumulates inside this, the body. And of course, you know, iron um, can participate in um, Fenton reaction and producing hydroxyl radical. It's very, very, you know, cause maybe uh, DNA damage and other cellular damage, tissue damage. So um, that's why we have the strict regulation of iron um, uptake and then sequestering of iron inside cells so that it can't participate in these reactions. So people with some of these diseases, like Cooley's anemia, would die by the second decade of life. So you might live to be 10 years old, and you would have a lot of deformities and your, um, really a lot of side effects from the disease besides dying. So it was discovered that um, several decades ago that uh, the siderophore, hydroxamate siderophore, you can see those hydroxamates, um, uh, desferioxamine B from a streptomycete, uh, trade name is desferol, um, could be injected through using a catheter system. So it's not orally effective. You eat it, and it'll go right through your body. But uh, if delivered into the bloodstream with a catheter system, a pump, on a regular basis, uh, it will circulate in the body, chelate iron, and it, that will be eliminated in the urine and um, feces. So this um, was able to extend the life of a lot of people. Um, and uh, the trouble was is it's a very difficult, especially for children, to you know, wear these, these catheter pumps. So compliance was a difficulty. Uh, Siba Geige um, produces this desferol. I'm not sure today you know, uh, how, how much this is used uh, versus some of the new synthetic compounds. This compound was developed um, and um, was showcased in the 1990s. And uh, the whole idea was to develop a compound that could be orally effective. And so uh, at one of those meetings I was just telling you about, uh, I think in the mid-90s, uh, uh, there was a uh, scientist, Nancy Oliveri. I think she was at the University of Tor Toronto. And she was telling us she was quite concerned because she was doing the clinical trials of this. And she had some evidence of liver, um, liver damage. Um, but her university was uh, accepting quite a lot of money from the same company that was developing it, uh, this uh, compound. So uh, she was bound not to speak about it, but she felt uh, an obligation to tell um, her colleagues that this was a concern of hers. So this compound was eventually uh, uh, approved for human use in Europe, but only recently has it been approved by the FDA to use in this country because of this concern. And so uh, quite a lot of study has gone on. And I just glanced at the literature. It seems like her concerns may not have been supported, her early concerns. But it just shows another dimension of research and possible conflicts of interest that um, 
can come up in your life, in your research lives. Okay, well, just to conclude then, uh, I told you about a story uh, concerning siderophores. They're microbial iron chelators. They're used to solubilize ferric iron, which has a very low solubility in our aerobic env environment, and it brings it into the cell or to the cell surface where the iron can be uh, transported into the cell. Ferrochrome is the um, original uh, uh, demonstration of, of this uh, type of molecule, it's cyclic peptide, uh, and it's produced by many fungi, including Eustilago species. Uh, we were able in my lab to develop the methods to isolate mutants and clone the genes, two of the genes for ferrochrome biosynthesis, um, encoding an ornithine oxygenase and a non-ribosomal peptide synthetase and a GATA transcription factor that binds to GATA sequences in the promoter region of SID1. And uh, this story tells you of, of an undergraduate research project. Um, I started, as I said, uh, working in the laboratory as an undergraduate um, research, um, uh, hourly researcher and uh, led me to uh, think about uh, how I might uh, study these, these problems in the future uh, and also how, how the University of California and the University of Wisconsin have uh, inadvertently collaborated <laughs> over the years through the work of Joe Neelands um, and um, Paul J. Allen and myself. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? How far up in the evolutionary tree do you see siderophores? Well, they're usually they're microbial. I mean, that's kind of the definition. Although there are some compounds referred to as phytosiderophores, but they're quite different. Um, I, you know, people have called them that. I, I don't know how appropriate it is, but um, uh, the term has. It's generic, generally been uh, used to refer to um, microbial compounds. Um, but there is the cross utilization, like there is evidence that plants can make use of siderophore iron. And when you look at this um, kind of in a, we've been looking at this in an isolated pure culture kind of a system or a, a plant, one plant and one bacterium or fungus rather. Um, but in the real world you have, you know, in your gut or in the soil or even in a real plant, um, the surface is covered with different <laughs> organisms. So you can have possible um, biocontrol or, you know, uh, uh, iron wars, you know, if your siderophores have <laughs> better so stability uh, constant than the other guys and, 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 and the, you can't use each other's siderophores, you might be, um, um, better able to compete for a particular environmental niche. So there's all kinds of things that you could imagine um, that might be at play in the real world. I had a college friend who was an engineer interested in metallurgy 50 years ago, 55 years ago, and he had the idea that you could grow bacteria in some real cheap substrate, garbage. Okay. Pump it down into the taconite mines of Minnesota oh. and have the, the microorganisms solubilize the iron, which we then just pump off by oh. pumping the water out of it. Okay. And I wonder if that ever is, is oh. anybody ever able to okay. use an airport for that purpose? Um, well, that would be, aren't those environments quite acidic? So I know, see, um, I don't know how you know these compounds would uh, survive in you know such if it is an acidic environment, but also um, you know the acidity also creates more solubilization for iron. So um, uh, you know you'd have to think about it a little bit, but offhand, um, I'm I guess uh, I guess it would be mainly the survival of the <laughs> compounds under a particular environment that. I, I'm not familiar with you know the details of such so an environment. Didn't get rich. 
No, I, I don't know if <laughs> anybody's tried to do something like that, but it would, would maybe make sense. Um, uh, yeah? You mentioned that um, corn strains today are resistant to corn smuts. Uh, What's the large. nature of uh, oh, okay. the genetic changes? Okay, you know, I, I'm not, I, I actually um, uh, am not familiar with uh, the, the breeding aspects of that, so I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I just know, you know, uh, casually that, that that seems to be um, the case. <laughs> Uh, you know, uh, more, um, I, I could, uh, if you want, I can find out and, and get back to you on that. Um, I know on campus here, some of the corn breeders, like Jerry Kermichael in genetics, um, his, his lines tend to be, tended to be very susceptible um, that he was using for his um, genetic studies of maize, but I'm not real familiar about the details of, of what he was doing. <laughs> um, uh, so. I can't re recall at this moment, <laughs> so I, I don't know if it's a polygenic or monogenic or, or it's just whatever. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay. Okay. <laughs>